Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. This week's episode is special in a number of ways. For one, it was recorded face-to-face with my guest back when people could do that sort of thing. And also, it's with a writer and producer whose work has been hugely influential on literally millions of people, myself included, even if he never expected that to happen. That would be Ed Solomon, a writer, producer, and occasional director who worked on Laverne and Shirley and its Gary Shandling show before moving into features among the Men in Black, Charlie's Angels, and the Now You See Me films. But perhaps his greatest contribution to humanity was the creation, with his writing partner Chris Matheson, of Bill S. Preston Esquire and Ted Theodore Logan, the cheerful idiots made immortal by Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And now, after almost three decades, the band is getting back together for Bill and Ted Face the Music, in theaters and available on demand this Friday, August 28th. Ed picked Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the 1975 feature that let Graham Chapman, John Cleese, Terry Gilliam, Eric Idle, Terry Jones, and Michael Palin run riot over the Arthurian legends for an hour and a half, bringing the sensibility of Monty Python's flying circus to the big screen and creating one of the greatest comedies ever. And yes, it's a gateway into a longer conversation about Ed's own work, just like all the best episodes of this show. So let's get into that. This is someone else's movie. I grew up worshipping at the altar of comedy and not knowing why. My dad and I used to sit and watch movies and laugh and maybe that's why. It was something my dad and I bonded on and initially we, uh, we started with Woody Allen not knowing that he would become Woody Allen. I remember my dad saying, remember that guy with that movie that we liked that made us laugh? He's got another one. You want to go see it? And the another one was Sleeper. We had just seen, I think, Take the Money and Run. Okay. Uh, though I'm not going to pick I'm not picking Woody Allen. Um, I'm going to say Monty Python and the Holy Grail because it was the first time, now that I had started being interested in comedy, that I realized that you could that there were people out there changing the form, you know, doing things that were ridiculously silly but also incredibly intelligent at the same time. I had no idea who they were. We watched. Uh, I didn't do it with my dad. I think I remember it was on PBS, and I didn't know anything about it. And I'm not even sure that it was somebody turn, turning me on to it, but I stumbled on it. Right. And I saw this sketch, um, and funnily enough, I think it was the full frontal nudity one because there were, like, first of all, it was boobs. <laughs> and I was like, wait, there's boobs on TV. It was PBS, but. Something drew me into it, and I was looking and going, without context, oh my God, I don't know who these people are, but I have a feeling they're going to change my world. What is this? Because it was just random sketch I came in on, and then I started watching it, and I went, I've never seen anything like this. It's really brilliantly funny. It's utterly absurd. It's ridiculous. It's silly what is this? I have to find more of it. And so I watched a few, you know, suddenly like, oh my God, did you see this thing? What is it? It was, no one had heard of it. It wasn't the movie yet. It was the TV show. And there's more? You know, it's a group? They're a group? What is that? Um, I remember watching some more and then... What year did Holy Grail come out? 75. 75. So, okay, yeah, that's, that's about right. Watched whatever I could find on PBS. Of course, there was no VCR. There was no way to find it in the library. There was no internet. There was nothing. It was just waiting until this thing comes on again. Yeah, that was my experience of it as well. It's like, I think, I, I think that was real, and I'm going to wait to see it and make sure. Yeah. Holy crap, there's another one. It's yeah. just as good. Oh, my God. And not every, you know, not every sketch is... is, is um, Successful, but oh, there know. was one in every episode. There was always there was something. always at least one, maybe more, sometimes a couple. But also, they were structured so strangely. Suddenly, they're in one, and the titles run. You know, six minutes in, the That's end right. titles run. Uh, that it, it blew my mind what they were what they were doing. And then Holy Grail comes out, and I think it was the second time, the first movie that I saw repeatedly was Mel Brooks um, Blazing Saddles where I couldn't believe what they were doing you know and again they were breaking the fourth wall as well or they yeah, yeah. you know at the end of Blazing Saddles suddenly 
it's modern, you know, they break out of the studio, the big fight, they're suddenly, I didn't realize you could do that. I was 12, 13. When was Blazing Saddles? 73? 74. 74. Okay, so. But yeah, I remember being just as so, stunned by that too. Yeah. So I'm 59. So I was, first saw Python, I want to say in 73 or 4. I was like probably a freshman in high school because I was just making Super 8 movies and I was experimenting with comedy and with my voice. We were making tapes, you know, we would make cassettes. And, and you know, I remember uh, one of my early sketches from, I think it was 10, was called Who Stole the Bean Dip that I did with my friend Warren, Warren Bross. Um, the first movie that knocked me onto my knees was Blazing Saddles, where I think, and I'm embarrassed to say, I think it was the farting scene around the campfire. I couldn't believe that they, they would do that. Yeah. It made me laugh so hard that I fell out of my seat, saw it probably every day in the theater for a couple of weeks. The second movie I did was Holy Grail, and that changed me even more because what we were just talking about. Holy Grail I saw repeatedly for, you know, for a series of, um, I don't know, just saw it. Weeks, months, weeks, years. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, had, had it memorized. Uh, would do it with my friends. I had my friend Lance from high school, a guy who I, you know, still friends with, but I really looked up to. He had, he, oh, I remember going to him and going, what is this thing? And he goes, what do you mean, what is this thing? And he started doing, you know, sketches after sketch, just he had to memorize. Um, so what was the experience of it the first time you saw it? Because I, mean, I, I came to it, Backwards. I actually knew someone who had the, the script book first. Uh -huh. So I read it and was... How did it read? It re I mean, it's mostly on the page. It may have simply been a transcription, ultimately, in the right. end. Um, well, no, they, they don't ad-lib. And they consider themselves writers first. Mm -hmm. They would write um, for each other, assign roles, and really perform it as written. They were, they were not improvers. There wasn't a lot of deleted material, which is what makes me think. Like there, there, actually, there was, there were, it had the longer versions of the Cancel Athrax scene. It had stuff that showed up later. You know, it, was, it read like the film that I ultimately saw. There wasn't a lot of fat on the script. Right. But I remember being, it, it might have even been my first experience of a screenplay, because it was basically printed script pages with photographs and, and doodle. You know, the, the Holy Grail script book was this big trade paperback foolishness it was it was really fun and had lots of pictures and it was very vivid and there was all sorts of stuff that didn't make sense visually and reading the script you could find the flows of the jokes that were I mean the wordplay was all there it's the 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 uh, I think the thing I most I remember most vividly is the line Dennis there's some lovely filth down here which is so <laughs> weird to see printed out and that got me like by the time I saw the film I knew right. I knew how it worked but I didn't know the rhythms of it and I didn't know how the deliveries went and it was just so it was like it was reverse engineered in my head as I was watching it right uh, but to see it cold without foreknowledge that, that's one of the only times I've gone into a movie knowing like literally everything right. that happens. And I was a kid and it was fine. I, I handled it. But yeah, to see it knowing what Python was, but then to experience that sort of un, un what's the word? Unmodulated version of it where it just bombs at you for 80 minutes and just hits you with ideas and visuals. And it's, it's so punk. It's so anarchic. How did you? Yeah. How did you handle <laughs> it? But it was punk. It? It, it, what it what it was for me was, oh my god, they don't care about standards of format. They don't care about what's come before. They're using everything as fodder to do whatever makes them laugh. They're clearly following their own, um, their own drummer here. You know, I mean, you have. You have two guys from Oxford or from Cambridge, Cleese and Chapman. You have three guys from Oxford, I believe that's correct. Um, you know, a rogue American, Michael Palin and um, uh, Eric Idle and uh, Terry Jones. And then I'm not, I'm not, I should know how Gilliam got involved. So you have the you have David Frost who puts them together. You guys should meet these guys. I think they're all going to write for the Frost Report. Yeah, I think so. And, and it was after Beyond the Fringe, right? So there was some yeah. awareness of this, this growing new wave of comedy. Well, and there was The Goon Show prior That's to that. Peter Sellers. And 
which was a real antecedent to Python. The, you can see when you look at some Goon Show stuff, you can see the Python standing on the shoulders of the Goon Show. Um, uh, I used to listen to that on the radio as a kid. They broadcast them in Toronto late night. Um, like I think it was Saturday nights there would be an episode of some old Vincent Price horror radio show yeah. and followed by the Goon Show and the Goon Show was the thing that just yeah, I, I that was Marty Feldman right uh, it was Peter Sellers Spike, Spike Milligan, Milligan and Harry Seacomb I'm not sure if Feldman what Feldman was, wasn't a regular he might have been involved with what it what was Feldman on then maybe the Frost Report I think it was on the Frost Report but yeah um, but yeah you're right the anarchy is there the, the sense that anything goes there's a what was the line about Something about, um, oh, this weird exchange about um, Eccles, the, the idiot character from, uh, who is, who is like really clearly a setup for a Gumby in, right. in Python. Oh, uh, okay. Saying, you know I'm educated, I'm wearing a Cambridge tie. You were at Cambridge, what were you doing there? Buying this tie. <laughs> and that's, that is Python, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also that, that cutting of, of the intellectuals and the class thing, it's all in there. Well, it was, you know, here's Socrates and whoever, they kind of remember who are the characters, but, and then, you know, we're going to put them, you know, playing soccer with each other. We're, whatever, it was these bizarre juxtapositions of the absurd and the intellectual that, and the silly and the ridiculous and the sense that, you know, they had the fish slapping dance, you know, where they're just, there's no... It just no value other than it's unbelievably ridiculous and funny, and you laugh. I, you know, it was a moment for me where I went, oh my God. I, I wouldn't even have the gumption to say there are people that see the world like I see it, because I didn't know that that was even possible, but oh my God, there's people that are seeing the, the world in the way that I wish I could. Yeah. And in fact, they always were, and I never succeeded at it, and I never will succeed at it. They were my model for, you know, what do you want to do with yourself as a writer? You know, I want to change comedy. I want to do my own version. I never did. I never could. I never had that. Ability. I just don't have the skills for that. When, when Chris Matheson and I wrote Bill and Ted first, Monty Python was a gigantic influence for us in terms of just, we wanted it to feel like Holy Grail. We wanted the, the rough edges. In fact, our production designer was Roy Fort Smith, who designed Holy Grail. And we were so excited that he, we were going to have a piece of, you know, of Python in, in Bill and Ted, which was just that we didn't have much money. He had made that movie for very little money, uh, Holy Grail. And we thought, well, he'll design this like that. I mean, it was like... I was shaking when I met him, I remember, just because of the uh, connection that, that he had had with him. Um, I remember going to see Python at the Hollywood Bowl, sitting way in the back, and weirdly, um, I got up to go get some popcorn. I remember. I remember it was popcorn, too. And there was a moment where Cleese came out uh, to the audience for some reason I don't even remember what and he was and we were way in the back you know I, it was 79 I was 19 I couldn't afford anything other than the worst possible seats at the Hollywood Bowl sure. I think there were five bucks and that was a stretch for me um, we I was st- and I came out to get popcorn and there was John Cleese and there was a crowd forming and the crowd forced me like a little bit of a like a surge right into him so I was stand- I was bumped into him uh had the opportunity to meet Cleese once, brought up this moment. Mm-hmm. He joked and said something, oh, that was you that, that got in the way or like uh, that annoyed me. I'm burying the big lead here that I probably didn't tell you. Um, ultimately, he's my father-in-law. He became my father-in-law. I did not know He's this. the grandfather of my kids. So I'm, <laughs> I, the irony of the whole thing is on one level, these two men influenced my comedy um, and your life in a very specific way and that my dad's like joy and watching comedy was one of the things that brought me into comedy suddenly Python becomes this group that I'm like astounded by Python became an influence for those first short films I was making it was an influence in Bill and Ted and then of course <laughs> my dad and John Cleese are the two grandfathers to my two children now yeah. So it's kind of a funny, ironic, uh, you know, blend. But uh, how 
I have to ask because this happens to no one that I know. How do you even process that? <laughs> to to, I mean, obviously, if you, I I have had the fortune to meet people I've admired, never not on that level uh, of, of of familiarity or intimacy. But the idea that this, you know, this actual legend is part of your life and that you, I mean. Did you just corner him and ask him questions over and over again? Did you do? You, did I you find have yourself... never, except for a couple of passing conversations, really? had these conversations with him. I'm very close with him. I really love him. He, sure. I was at. Uh, I'm no longer married to his daughter, but we've remained close. In fact, I was at his 80th birthday party last week in Las Vegas. Yeah. My girlfriend and her son and I went. Um, he's very close with my kids. Uh, John is. Um, I've never wanted that. To be honest, to be a part of my relationship with him, it felt it never felt. I know it sounds strange, but I mean, you're both writers. If nothing else, you're we've talked talk about, about writing. We've talked about our work. We've talked about what are you working on? What are you working on? We've I've asked him a few questions here and there, but mm -hmm. I um, and he knows. I I told him, hey man, I, you know, I was a giant fan of Python, but I don't think I went beyond that. I Faulty Towers is. Is yeah, is well. one of the best, I think, best paradigms for farce in in the English language, and, you know. And the sitcom, as you know, like as it is, as it oh. was, it's yeah. There's, I mean, there's stuff about it that's dated, but the mechanics of it are just yeah, it's remarkable. It took about six weeks to write each. Uh, he wrote six uh, early, and then was divorced. And Connie is my is my kid's um, grandmother, huh? and uh, Cynthia is uh, the. Daughter of John and Connie. Connie co-wrote Faulty Towers, and yep. she played Polly yep. the maid. Yep. And Cynthia grew up on the set of that, you know. And so even when Cynthia, when Cynthia was sick, you know, and home sometimes, and she didn't have, she, she's not, she doesn't have a super close relationship with um, her dad right now or her her parents. She just, they're just not, for whatever reason, they're not as um, in touch. Sure. And uh, though, but even in the darkest times of that when she was sick she used to watch Faulty Towers which she would say was the only time growing up because they got divorced between the first and the second season mm -hmm. of Faulty Towers which were a few years apart from each other she talked about that as like a chance to see her parents happy together a chance to see her parents doing something they both loved a chance to see them parents making each other laugh and she would sit on the floor and watch Faulty Towers when we were married and just laugh and laugh. It was a beautiful thing to watch, actually. Um, how people who, you know, um, uh, kind of, they really, they really loved what each other could do for each other. I'm talking about John and Connie mm -hmm. in the making of that. And I think, I think you can see it. They worked, you know, as a couple on it, created it, wrote it together, starred in it. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've tried really hard not to, to have, I've tried really hard to have my relationship with John be a, fami a familial relationship and not about work. And um, we did work together briefly on a couple things, but one of them was a coincidental, which is I was consulting on a sitcom with that a friend of mine had created. I was just doing a one day a week. And it turns out he was going to be a guest star. But my f nobody, it, there was no connection to that. So um, we ended up having a meeting. The writers had to meet with him to talk about his character. And I was working on that one day. So I was a part of that. It was kind of um, coincidental. And one time he did a voice for us in something. We made an animated, my uh, Chris Matheson and I, uh, my partner on Bill and Ted, he and I wrote a ridiculous animated movie that we never could get made. It made us laugh so much. <laughs> we worked our ass off on it. We believed in it so much that we spent our own money to hire people to do a recording as animated, and we thought, well, sh you know, if, if we record this, we'll have our... If we get actors and we gave it to various people and we got the most unbelievable cast assembled, all who read the script, and we spent our own money and we recorded the whole thing, and then we thought, it's kind of like doing an animated film on spec, and then we'll go to the market and we should be able to get this thing set up anywhere. And we had 
It was Jack Black and John C. Riley doing the two main characters called automatons, which mm -hmm. is there were these insecure robots built in World War II to get Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. They were shipped off. Their submarine sank. The project was abandoned. They were presumed gone. But they'd been wandering the bottom of the ocean for like 50 years. <laughs> and the process, the pressure, the salt, who knows, made them really insecure. And when they emerge, they emerge at the mouth of the Mississippi River in Minneapolis, St. Paul. They emerge still thinking they're going to get Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. It turns out Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini have frozen themselves and are now trying to win back love <laughs> to repent for their mistakes by putting on a production. They wanted to put on a production of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, but they didn't have the rights. So they, uh, they, were, they were denied the rights. So they wrote their own production called You're a Very Good Boy, Charlie Blue. And we're putting it on in a community theater in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And that's, it was so, the whole story was so absurd. But we had Gary Shandling did a voice, Fred Armisen. Uh, we had Rachel Dratch. We had Chris Parnell. And we had for Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. Tojo was Fred Armisen. Mussolini was Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> And John Cleese did Hitler, which was surreal in and of itself. Stallone recorded on his own because he didn't want to record in a group. So he did the Mussolini stuff. And then Armisen and Cleese did Tojo and Hitler around Stallone's performance. It's some of the strangest, most surreal, most hilarious stuff. Anyway, we... we how we has have, Netflix not picked How has nobody picked it up? Yeah. Not one person ever picked it. There was no Netflix at the time, well, but now there by is. the way. You still have the recording, I hope. I, we do have the recording. All right, we'll get um, it. <laughs> you know, we, it's funny. I, I tweeted about this and um, Project Once. I was just mentioning something. I don't remember how it came up. And we did get a call from someone saying, hey, what about doing it here? It was Adult Swim. And I thought, we could probably do that. But I can't really reassemble the cast anymore. And their deal with them was such that it wouldn't be... We can't just suddenly now sell it. But what I do have is the strangest, most str strangely, uh, what's the word? Not curated, but well, I, had an, I had this experience. I probably, la la hardest I've ever laughed in my life. Chris and I were sitting on the floor of the Four Seasons in LA where Cleese was staying. Me and Chris and Fred Armisen went to go see Cleese to sort of meet and see if this would all work. This and Fred and John riffing for I don't even know forty five minutes. I never recorded it. God, I should have recorded it. I was watch. It was the funniest, and Armisen in particular, but John was funny too, obviously. But like the the guys just riffing as them as Hitler and Tojo and for this private little performance. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know. How lucky am I? I get to like have this experience that nobody is having, and no one ever will again because it's gone. Yeah. We didn't even record it. But we, these recordings that we d did, I know I feel like I witnessed this. Re we had a week. We recorded it over the course of a week. And I feel like I witnessed this very strange iteration of this film that no one will ever see that was a comedic high point for me. Billy Bob Thorne was in it, Holly Hunter, Catherine O'Hara. Oh, my God. Oh, no, it was incredible. But it's, you know, it's too weird. We brought it to every studio, and they're like, we can't, po you have Hitler in this. We can't possibly do it. They're, like, they're doing this terrible performance where they've written terrible music and terrible lyrics and terrible acting. And we did it. We wanted to do it stop motion. In fact, we actually made four demos of the stop motion but recording it ourselves using our own voices uh -huh. we spent all this time and money we believed in it so much nothing happened with it except that I had my own private strange comedy experience that was wonderful but gone that's, yeah. that's remarkable um, but yeah uh, but the thing about Python that was so uh, invigorating was you can be really brilliant and do ostensibly silly things and it can have a lot of value you know if you're just following your own voice you know um, you know I did it's funny I have seen him talk about Python because we went he did a show we went to see him in Vegas and he did a performance where he talks about that stuff so most of my knowledge of that is just public knowledge or right, right. Um, yeah uh, 
and it is it's one of those things where there are just it's the Beatles it's kids in the hall right the, yeah. the it's the alignment of the sensibilities and the point where yes with Python you generally know who wrote what they're they're very specific about breaking that down yeah uh, Eric Idle on, on um, Conan O'Brien's podcast just the other day just jokingly said oh I wrote with myself like, huh. Huh. casually taking credit for whatever it is he wrote right. um, but it's it's Palin and Jones and it's Cleese and Chapman and it's the the animations from Gilliam and, and just the way that in Holy Grail it really does like I think Life of Brian is probably the perfect version of their sensibility just because Holy Grail doesn't really have an ending in the same way that Life of Brian does like just that it has a musical number that yeah. really brings everything together uh, but Holy Grail is like watching them all fight for the steering wheel you're just swinging <laughs> through sensibilities and at such a speed that it really doesn't matter who's in charge at any given moment. You know, like Chapman, just by virtue of playing one character effectively in both films, sort of becomes the leading man. But it could just as easily have been, I mean, I think Jones could have played Arthur. I think Palin could have probably played Arthur. Cleese as well, but Cleese is almost by virtue of being so tall, would be wrong for King Arthur. Right. You know, he would have too much status. Chapman makes him question his authority or like constantly makes us question whether or not the guy deserves to be king. Right. Can't count to five. Or can't count to three, I'd do it. Uh, but it, that is just... And then growing up and, and watching it over and over again, coming back to it as an adult and realizing that the those that monologue, Dennis's monologue about an anarcho-syndicalist commune, that's actually not just made up. That, that All of that theory is not only applicable, those but actually... Those guys were brilliant. Cleese was yeah. a lawyer. They were... I mean, they're all, they're, they're all brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people. It's... It, it well. You're, it speaks to what yours is saying about the group thing. It, you know, Kids in the Hall, SNL, Python, you name it. Look at look at Nichols and May. Mm-hmm. Um, when people are starting and forming their their points of view, very rarely does being a solo flyer really help. So often, I would say it. It's more often than not, and maybe almost all the time, except for some exceptions. Look at look at Woody Allen with Mel Brooks and, and the Sid C- and you know your show of yeah. shows Mel Brooks Neil Simon Mel Tolkien Woody Allen Larry Gelbart are all writers on your show of shows having a group of people where you can you can you know fist fight with creatively where you you challenge each other where you criticize each other where you compete with each other where you support each other where you make each other laugh and then you make each other mad and all those things are very formative and I think really important and I always tell. Like I try, I'm teaching, a, I teach a class when I can at NYU in writing, and I try everyone, you know, I try as much as I can to talk to young people about it, and it helps me, and, and more than it helps them probably. But one of the things I'm always saying is find groups, find groups that challenge you, find groups that, you know, you are both like-minded but also not. Find the right blend of people where you can push and push and push, and I think that, you know, without those groups. You know, it's that magic synergy. You know, you, you work with these people, you meet another, they challenge, you push, you move on to the next thing. People are always thinking, especially younger people, I need to network. You know, I need, and they always think networking is meeting producers or meeting agents or meeting executives. To me, networking is about finding like minded, creative souls that are peers of yours that you can rise with, that you can fight with, that you can grow with. That's the networking that's important. If you do that and you just keep following your creative vision, at the end of the day, people will end up coming to you because you're creating the doorway for yourself to go through as opposed to waiting for a gatekeeper to open a doorway for you. You're just making doors. It's like in Blazing Saddles. That great scene where it's like they're in the middle of the desert and they got to they got to come up with a way to stop them and they say, well, let's put up a toll. And they put up a toll booth in the middle of the desert and they go, ah, we got to go back and get a whole shitload of dimes. But but in a way, what's to me brilliant about that is it's like they're just going, we're going to be the gate. We're just putting up a gate. That's not really the best metaphor. <laughs> okay, take it. I take it back. I can sort of see it though. I mean, it is true that no one was going to make Python Python accept themselves their their humor was i mean there yeah beyond the fringe was there there was a precedent for the sort of intellectual absurdism but it isn't until you get 
the shouting that it becomes Python, I think. Like, if there's this undercurrent of repression and aggression that they brought to British comedy that hadn't existed before, I don't think. Oh, interesting. Spike what do you, what do you mean? Spike was doing ridiculous things. Peter right. Sellers was doing precise character stuff. But it isn't until you see the Gumbies or it isn't until the upper class tour of the year, those, those ideas where there's rage underneath and there's anger and it's completely entitled anger, I don't even know that they understood it. But ultimately, Holy mm-hmm. Grail is about a king wandering around, helpless, useless, <laughs> trying to find this prize, which is ultimately meaningless. Right. Because God told him to. And it's right. just, I think it's just how they're telling... Well, Life of Brian is a guy, you know, it's yeah. like, it's not me, you know. Exactly. The yeah. literal son of God is two doors over. <laughs> and this, we're stuck with this guy. And that was their joke from the very beginning. Like, what if we watch this one? But it's about people trying to claim power that they don't have or don't deserve. And in Life of Brian, they just reverse it by having him run away from it all. Right. And having everyone else insist that his, his nonsensical sayings mean something. And this, this sense of, I think, God help me, I think, and I just said, God help me, I think this is where I first really understood what atheism was with, uh, with Python. Yeah. Because everything is meaningless. Authority will not help you. And when God shows up, he's angry and useless. <laughs> I mean, the aliens in Life of Brian... It's just such a, it apparently was just a coin flip effectively of, well, how do we get him out of this? Right. I don't know, flying saucer. And then, <laughs> well, that's the thing when you're doing that. We did this on Gary Shanley show a lot. Is you write your, you laugh yourself into a corner and you don't know how to get yourself out. Yeah. And it forces you to come up with something. And when it was working for us on, on It's Gary Shanley show, we would write ourselves in, we, we, like the Python guys, we didn't have a lot of supervision. Uh, which is, a, I think, personally, a great way to make comedy. You have somebody who trusts you and gives you an outlet but doesn't tell you what to do. Fantastic. Nobody was watching our show, so <laughs> nobody seemed to care. We would write ourselves into a corner and run out of money or run out of story ideas and we'd be stuck. And now suddenly uh, we've literally written ourselves into a corner. We're in the corner of the stage. We don't have another set we can create. How do we get him out? We'll have him break the fourth wall and walk across the front. Or we can't afford an actual airplane set. Let's just build a paper airplane and call this the airplane. Wait a minute. Why don't we just do that? And when it's going well, the critics would be like, well done. They're breaking the standards. But what what they didn't realize when we were on the critic side was, this is not on purpose. <laughs> this is just people who are trying to laugh, who suddenly realize that it's 3 a.m. And if we don't have a script by 5 a.m., we have nothing to shoot to get printed. What are we going to do? And we stumbled through it that way, I think, with Python as well. But that's yeah. part of it, right? Because if you trust your intuition, or you have no choice but to trust your intuition, you're going to do the thing that you want to do. Like, it's an act of creation that is valid because it's being created but also the desperation I think makes us want to believe in it uh, I there's a, there was a moment in, in It's Gary Shandling's show that I've never forgotten it's the scene where something goes missing on set and Gary notices it and talks to the audience and just says I think I can't remember what it was a wallet hmm, or something I don't remember it's really either. something basic but it's you know, like or a watch or a wallet and he just says you know, like I'm going to turn around and Whoever took it, just put it back. It's fine. It's going to be fine. And someone comes out of the audience and replaces the item, and security guards swoop in and grab him. And the but the joke for me is that you can't trust Gary Shanley. And it's just, it's so great. It's like it's the moral the moral fabric of the world is maintained, but it was done through a trick. Well, Shanley show, I learned a ton about writing and uh, a ton about the f- internal physics of a show. Of, a, of something and what makes something work and what makes something not work at least what are your better odds at making something work versus not work and on, on Gary Shanley's show what we learned and um, it's different than like Holy Grail which is really a series of set pieces yeah. you know conceived to make people laugh to make each other laugh sketches within a rough framework of you know yeah. 1932 AD but yeah yeah uh up until the very end. <laughs> we'll say that again? Well, up until the very end of Holy Grail when it's just... Right. Yeah. Pure, pure anarchy of the present. Yeah. yeah but you're sorry, Shanling was... But, oh, and, and before I get into the Shanling, what I would also say one last thing about the Python yeah. thing, which made it so appealing, and it relates to the, to the Shanling thing, and in a way, is in my own experience, was also relates to the creation of Bill and Ted, which I'll get to in a second. Yeah. And that is... The divining rod was what makes us laugh. And, 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 and going toward that, and I think 
there's something not just infectious about that, but actually true about what makes people attracted to something. It's not because it fits into a formula of what has already been done or expected. And this is what I hate about screenwriting books, that they tell you a, a movie has to be this. Right. this is, and, and people try to write movies by, by hitting this on X on page 10 and Y on page 20 and Z on page 30. And it's like, you're, it's so wrong. You're just creating these Frankenstein monsters of the script. When in fact, what you're really looking for what people are really responding to is a voice, originality, a voice, somebody expressing something that is unique to them. And what happens is when you do that, if you get it so that it's actually flying, but it's your own voice, other people turn and go, what is that? And yeah. they follow it. And that's what happened, I think, with Python. When things were working on Shanling Show, and this was the point I was getting to about the physics, um, when it was working, we didn't have to worry about making it fit into anything. We were, it, we found its own rhythm. We found our rhythm. The thing that I learned about that was because we were breaking the fourth wall and we were doing all sorts of things that uh, theoretically weren't. Uh, they'd been done, but not in a popular way, um, and not that we were popular because nobody saw it. But uh, I found that shows that we created that were based on the physics of the show. Like we had an idea for a gimmick and then we tried to retrofit a story into it. Yeah. it, it they never worked. But stories that had genuine emotional truth, um, that were about something real, that we then would create, we would then write, and then the, the ideas, the bizarre premises, strange gimmicks, breaking the fourth wall, walking out in front of the set, or whatever talking the way he would talk to the audience and whatever those things would fall into place naturally and the shows always worked better my favorite of the Gary Shandling shows was um, so for the, a lot of people won't know what the show is basically Gary Shandling it's Gary Shandling show was a show about a guy named Gary Shandling played by Gary Shandling who has a TV show called it's Gary Shandling show that he runs out of his living room that was a set that was basically based on Gary's actual living room <laughs> But the basic premise was he's running a show called It's Gary Shandling Show out of his living room and nobody else knows that it's a TV show except him, which gives him a special relationship with the audience. My favorite episode. The audience, which is present for those of you who haven't seen it. There is an actual Oh, there's a studio audience. audience in, right, exactly. Which, which is, is just yeah. something I'd never seen before. <laughs> the acknowledgement of the audience, the, the fact right. that you were watching this sort of relationship. Well, this episode was very much about that. It was an episode I wrote with uh, Tom Gamble and Max Prost, two brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guys that are still on Simpsons now, did Seinfeld, They're, they were on SNL before. Um, and talk about groups of people that just, man, Mike and Al, who were also on Simpsons, Tom and Max, there was like a series of comedy writers who could get to places that I could never get to and will never be able to get to, but having the opportunity to work with people like that, you know, help flex my own muscles, but made me really appreciate just how brilliant people like that are. Anyway, um, I had had this idea for this episode and uh, we had to write it really fast. So Tom and Max and I all wrote it together. The premise was um, Gary's best friend, uh, Schumacher, uh, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting his but Grant is the kid. Um, uh, Grant is this kid. Uh, is Gary's like not really nephew, it's his best friend's son. Grant, uh, the sh Grant wins a poetry competition. He wrote a poetry competition and the prize was a trip to Hollywood for the family. Now they live in Sherman Oaks, which is right. you know just over the hill from Hollywood. Um, so the Schumacher, this episode's called The Schumachers Go to Hollywood. So Grant and his family are gonna go to Hollywood to have a trip. Meanwhile, Gary is charged with feeding Grant's fish while Grant's away. So the Schumachers go to Hollywood, but again, whereas, so the Schumachers go to Hollywood and they have to drive to Hollywood from Sherman Oaks, and now they're on Hollywood Boulevard and they're looking around and someone's handing out tickets to a television show and they go, hey, what if we go to Uncle Gary's show? We'll go to its Gary Shandling show. And they're like, oh, what a good idea. So the Schumachers have to then drive, you know, to the set, even though the set, yeah. The set of Hollywood Boulevard is on the stage of the show itself, and the, the studio audience is watching the Schumachers, 
Then they go, oh, now we have to drive. So they get into their car, and then there's footage of them driving. They pull up outside the stage, and they have to now enter through the, they come in through the back of the audience and come down to watch the show. While, and now they're sitting in the audience. Now they're watching the show, and Gary's on stage. And Gary, they come in during the scene where Gary is feeding Grant's fish. And they're like, oh, it's Grant, you know, it's, it's my, you know. And he's feeding the fish, and he finds the poem that Grant had written that won him the award. And it's a love poem to this girl named Lily Wu. And um, Gary reads the poem out loud um, that, that Grant had written. Um, and it humiliates Grant, and he's livid. And so Grant and the family are pissed at Gary, but they can't leap off the stage and go onto the set because the physics won't allow that, of the internal physics of the yeah, show itself. Yeah, of course. They have to get in their car and drive all the way back and storm into the, to Gary's apartment because they couldn't obviously break that. And the audience, even though technically they were six feet away from Gary, had they done that, it would have broken a contract in a weird way between the you know viewer yeah, and yeah. but that was my favorite episode because it it was an emotional story that was kind of true but it and it, but it used the physics in a way that to me was the most fun well I mean it acknowledges it or rather it forces the show to acknowledge just how weird and artificial everything is in a way that it couldn't before but Even it keeps the audience on in on the artificiality right. so that everyone is in on the same joke and everyone is playing on everyone is sharing the same understandings and you would have known I mean if they had leapt over the balcony the whole show would have imploded yeah because the audience has never done other than the shoplifting moment the, the, the audience has never done that there's not that kind of access available to those of us who are watching who are those of us in the room in the audience on the TV right watching on TV well, I don't it's know. What, like, I don't remember the shoplift, like this, the thing being stolen. I just don't. Yeah, maybe I didn't work on it because I didn't all work. I worked for the first three seasons, but I worked on and off because Bill and Ted was getting made as well. So I left sometimes and came back. So it was the. It was like the very last moment of an episode. That's where the credits roll with the guy being escorted off by security. But it's just <laughs> genius. Wow. But and the thing that this that Gary Shandling's and Bill and Ted's and Python all have in common are the, is people describe them all as whimsical, which I think means. That we are, I mean, whimsical has a lot of different meanings depending on who's saying it and who hears it. But I think for this usage, what it means is that we're invited to share the play. Like we're, invi- we're allowed to experience the same joy the writers have in crafting this stuff. We're, we are in on the jokes of Python in a way that we're in on the jokes of Gary Shandling's show. And just, you know, water loops. Right. It's such, I saw that, I saw a whole audience take a second and reverberated through the room mm-hmm. as they all figured it out. That joke is layered and set up, and we get to feel how much fun it was for you two to come up with it. Well, I, I'm going I'm to shatter your dreams here. No. I believe Waterloops was Steve Herrick's notion, the joke of Waterloops itself, calling it Waterloops because of Napoleon. Right, yeah. That was actually not our joke. We wouldn't have done that. I would not have called it that, actually. We actually called it Raging Waters, which is what it was, but Raging Waters wouldn't give us the rights. So oh. it was actually Steve Herrick who said, how about water loops? Because it's a pe- play on Waterloo. And yeah. we were like, okay. But that's such a... Per- where would he go? Water loops. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. <laughs> oh, God. So the I can't take credit for that. So the material itself generated. <laughs> so, yeah, Steve did. I mean, Steve was responsible for it being a phone booth. We had a, It was a van. And then Back to the Future came out. And they were like, it's too much like, like Back to the Future. So they, Steve changed it to a phone booth, which I, I wish we had pushed back harder on. Uh, eh, it's too much like Doctor Who. I didn't yeah, know so, Doctor Who at the yeah. time. Well, the we didn't have, there wasn't the internet. There was, you know. It was in a lull at that time anyway. Yeah, it, look, we were like te- teenage or the early 20s people in LA in the early 80s creating this thing, and we weren't aware of Doctor Who. I'm embarrassed to say. I wish I had been. I don't know how I would have been, but I wish I had been yeah. because I wouldn't have done a phone, but it's too much like the TARDIS. Yeah. Um, but having said that, the. The what is the same is not the level of humor or anything, but the act of creating it in a way that makes you laugh, that only makes you laugh. And Bill and Ted was created out of me, Chris Matheson, our friend Ryan Rowe, Mark Sandarowski, and Mark Jaffe, the five of us. Um, and Mark's a comedian and a comedy writer in, in Cleveland now. And Mark Sandarowski is a director. Uh, of, of, he directs uh, television. He's an amazing TV director. 
Ryan Rose, a writer as well. Chris is, you know, Chris is also a writer. But at the time, we were 21, 22, 23, and we were, uh, you know, like me, these guys all worshipped the altar of comedy. We wanted to push ourselves. We wanted to expand. And so we rented a theater for 20 bucks a night. We, in, it's called the Gardner Stage. I don't know if it still exists. On Sunset and Gardner in Hollywood. I think it was Monday, so they were dark that night. 20 bucks, we just used the stage. And we'd work out doing stand-up. I'm not stand-up, improv. But the characters were... Yeah. Well, but we weren't even... Tr- like, we never had an audience. We didn't want an audience. And we, we weren't trying... Even though we're all writers, we weren't trying to create characters or come up with ideas for movies. It wasn't about showcasing ourselves. It was about purely pushing ourselves comedically. And for sure, Python was an influence to us, as were some of the other absurdist you know, things that seem to break barriers. And all we would do is just like throw out ideas and go for it and try to improv stuff and just make shit up without paying any attention to what happens with it. We never recorded anything ever. I wish to God we had now because we did it for years. Who knows what passed through that that we have no, I have no memory of almost all of it, but how Bill and Ted came up was one random moment in one random evening I remember Matheson saying let's do two guys who know nothing about history studying about history I was like okay and he called me Ted I called him Bill and Ryan was there he was Bob Mark was Mr. Williams who was originally Ted's original last name his father and there was Rufus who was Mark Jaffe who for some reason was a a 27 year old high school sophomore that was also there and we just fucked around doing Bill and Ted. And Chris and I enjoyed that a lot. So that night we went to a coffee shop and continued just doing Bill and Ted with each other. And then over the course of a year, just messed around as Bill and Ted sometimes. Never doing them in a sketch again, but just together. Or we'd write letters sometimes as Bill and Ted or, or just do the guys because they were so much fun to do. And a year later, we wanted to do a... Um, Oh, another influence, Kentucky Fried Movie oh, yeah. style movie, The Zuckers. Uh, you know, it was like Python, series of sketches. We wanted to do a sketch movie, and we wrote, we did a few different, we wrote about eight or ten sketches for this movie. One was Automatons, which became that thing, Automatons, yeah. which we wrote 20 years later to be Automatons, which still exists, but no one will ever see. And Bill and Ted were characters in a seven minute sketch. And it was Chris's father, months and months later, when Chris and I decided, what if we wrote an actual movie? What would the actual movie be? And it was Chris's father who said, you know, you, I always thought you should expand. And Chris's father is a very noted science fiction writer. Oh, well, I know. Yeah, Richard Matheson. Richard Matheson, I am yeah. Legend. The, the, yeah. The, the inventor accidentally of the modern zombie, basically, because we That's never right. relied on the book. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, no, Sorry absolutely. On. I mean, he was a... He, Richard Matheson was a uh, visionary and you know influenced people like Stephen King and, you know... But Richard said, well, that, Bill and Ted, those two guys, that would, why don't you consider making that into a full-length movie? And we're like, could we do that? And then we just started throwing ideas around and trying to make each other laugh. Same reason. We had no idea that people would end up seeing it. I remember Chris looking across the diner from me, looking up while we were writing and going, somebody could even read this. <laughs> we might get people to read this script. But all we wanted to do was just push ourselves and make each other laugh and make ourselves laugh. And that's what we did. And the characters became the script, but that's the characters emerged out of a group of people just trying to make each other laugh without regard to doing something with it. Right. It's that let's do something with it thing that changes it all. It puts the it's it becomes Schrodinger's cat all of a sudden as opposed to a pure experiment, you know? Yeah. Actually, and that's an excellent way of putting it, because as soon as you decide this is going to be looked at Right by some. It changes else. it all. It changes it. Makes you subconscious. And it's funny because for two guys, me and Chris, who both wanted to be writers, both wanted to be comedy writers, it never crossed our mind to turn them into characters in a movie or a sketch show or anything for a year. Never. And I'm really glad it didn't. I'm really glad. I think I made a lot of career mistakes. I made a lot of creative mistakes. I made a lot of personal mistakes in my life. I don't regret the way we went about that period of life comedically and just trying to get better and trying to get better. Now, I'll never, 
So, oh, actually, ironically, back to something we were talking about earlier. Yeah. We've got the script. I gave it to my agents. Mm, I was 23. My agents at the time hated it. I remember there's an actual, <laughs> I remember this very clearly. I'm talking to an agent. He goes, I am begging you not to send the script. Do you hear this? I'm going to hear the sound like that. That's me falling to my knees, begging you <laughs> to not send the script out. It's like, holy shit. And I was like, Chris, I don't know what we're going to do. We got to like, they don't like it, you know. It's like, all right, I know what to do. I'm going to go in and I'm going to rally the troops. I'm going to get them, you know. And he drive, we, we go in his car. He has a persimmon Carmen Ghia. And we drive into the parking structure. He stays in the garage. I go, I'm going to go up. I'm going to do my thing. We, I'd arrange the meeting. Um, there's five agents in the conference room. This is the big meeting with this client who had a Laverne and Shirley TV job and showed promise, but struggled writing a script, wrote another screenplay. I had written an earlier script that they had liked. It's not a very good script, honestly. And now I've got this other script that I seem to really believe in, and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do with this client? Are we going to... And my objective is to rally them into getting behind it. And it becomes one of those, like if it was a scene from a movie that swoops, the score would be swelling. Right. There'd be a beat forming as I'm going, and you know, i got to tell you something. I believe in this. And if you don't believe in this, maybe you're not the right people to represent me. And maybe we should go our own separate ways. And Because I really think this is funny. And in fact, I think, and blah, 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 blah. And silence, silence. Then one of the agents says, well, then maybe you should go your own way. And the other agents go, yeah, maybe we're not the people for you. And I go back to him. He's like, how'd it go? <laughs> and I'm like, we don't have agents. I was like, oh, shit. Um, and I have the script. Nobody wanted it. I was out of money. I had borrowed money from my parents. I thought my Laverne and Shirley job was a flash in the pan. Because I, you know, that job had gotten through my, I'd gotten freshman year or senior year of, of college. I was like, I guess that's it for my writing career. Uh, and then thankfully an agent, an agent read it who I had met a year and a half earlier. Hey, would you mind reading this? And he liked, and you know, it, we ended up, it ended up connecting. We got, it got set up and it took years of development and all that where we almost destroyed it so many different ways, different times. Ended up going back to a very close iteration to what it originally was, thankfully, luckily. Um, yeah, but what we were trying to do was Python. We were trying to... I didn't like the Bill and Ted movie when it first was finished because it was too polished for me, even though, in hindsight, if I've, I haven't really seen it much. I've only seen it three times total in my life. The one recent time was when we did a DVD commentary for a Blu-ray release, mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen it in 20 years, probably at least. I saw it when it, a screening and on opening day, and then I never saw it again. Bogus Journey, same, I saw it twice. Um, and the second time was for the uh, DVD right. commentary, which made for an interesting commentary because I hadn't seen it in so long. But... Uh, so I was really disappointed seeing it the first time because it didn't seem like a Python film. It seemed like a movie, like a regular movie that was a very watered down and sort of cleaner version than we had expected. Ours was more raucous and rough edged in my mind. Right. In hindsight, I'm very proud of the movie. In fact, I'm the most proud of that, of anything probably that, that, that I've done, only because it has a spirit that transcended its mistakes. And there were a lot of mistakes, and there were things in that movie I regret, and there were things in that movie that I wish weren't in there a lot. But overall, the, the generosity of spirit of it, as embodied by Alex and Keanu, who are wonderful, and great guys, by the way, and great partners on this new movie, and great friends. Good. I'm not, I'm not friends with Keanu. I'm, we're friendly, and we work together, and I've worked on quite a few things with him, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't call it as personal like friends outside of the work mm -hmm. I like them a ton though and I respect them a lot um, Alex and I have become good friends just because we um, kept hanging out and then also uh, worked together really hard on getting this third movie made so he and I have become friends but um, 
I feel like I've been rambling. No, it's all, but it's all, <laughs> it's all part of it. It is really. And, and what I was gonna, I mean, if anyone's still listening, sorry, someone is always still listening. We have, the, we have the numbers on this. Uh, what I was gonna say is the 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 last question on the podcast is always the same, which I think we've more or less covered. But it's you know what of Holy Grail have you used? Have you cannibalized? Have you assimilated into your own creative? Personality, your sensibility, your DNA. Where, like, where can you point to something that you've done and say that's where Holy Grail shines through, or is it more just an attitude and an aesthetic? Oh yeah, and this is where I was going with the the story I was about to say, which is then, which when Bill and Ted got set up, we became the flavor of the month for a little while. We go to meeting after meeting. The voice and the script apparently seemed somewhat unique. The script scene, it was doing our job. We suddenly were getting these job offers and all this stuff. People would always say, what do you want to do? I want to be Python. I've never become Python. I would never have become Python. It served only as an aspiration for me to push myself. I will never hit that. It's like the rabbit, you know, the greyhound chasing the metal rabbit. Yeah. On the, I will never catch it. I will never. And that's okay. I got depressed for a while, like, I'll never be able to do that. I don't have the chops for that. I have the chops to keep pushing myself. I did have the foresight to try to uh, keep strengthening some of my weaknesses, but comedy, you, can't, you can get proficient, but if you're, not, if you're not a genius, you can't get to where those people can get to. And I'm not a genius. I'm good enough to work my skills, to be able to get stuff to work for the most part by the end of the process, hopefully, but not always. In other words, and comedy is hard and it's hard to do as an adult, as you get older. It's a young person's game, not for the reasons that I think people think it is, which is the culture. The comedy is all contextual, it's all context, mm -hmm. in my opinion. The you had to be there thing is actually true. It doesn't mean it wasn't funny then. It means it was contextually funny. Yeah. You know, combination of elements. It's yes. the people, the time, the sensibility. Absolutely. hundred yeah, yeah. percent. And it's the relate it's the audience and the expectation of the audience. You know, Python, when you go to see a Python movie, they built a brand. If if Holy Grail came out without the show, probably nobody they would have gone, what the hell is this? But because they'd already built up the sense of a relationship with its audience, people were open and accepting of it. Um, I wanted to be that. But what I was going to say about as you get older, what, what, what happens is, I mean, the best I could do was work with a great friend, Chris, on Bill and Ted, laugh like crazy, writing it, work on Gary Shandling with great people and laugh working on it. Even Men in Black, I could laugh working on it, but by then even, I'm in my early 30s, early mid 30s, I knew that I couldn't lean on my comedy chops for much longer because it's not just that the culture changes, it's that you as an adult change. Even though you can appreciate, I laugh more in my life now than I probably laughed ever. I love my life more. I appreciate comedy a lot. I still do. I love nothing. No, I, I have such a weak spot for people that really make me laugh. Mm -hmm. But I knew about 20 years ago that if I don't start to grow my skills into other areas, I'll be the most pathetic of all creatures, which is an aging comedy writer. And there's nothing worse, man, than like somebody who's not quite funny or can't quite get there who is still trying. Yeah, still insisting on it. Yeah, and it's sad and it's hard. However, that was my driving force. That's what I wanted to do. I, would, I wanted to be, you know, the Python, Woody Allen. If it was music, I wanted to be Springsteen, Dylan. I never yeah. was. I, like, I... I never will, but I'm looking back going, you know, but I have a, I have a career that has had ups and downs, a lot of downs, but enough ups that I've, you know, the, the tent, the, there's enough poles in the tent that the tent's up and providing some shelter, you know, sure. I'm still growing as a writer, I'm still working, 
I'm working on probably some of my most interesting things, certainly with some of the best people I've ever worked with, on projects that are really fascinating to me. And though I didn't carve that path out that I originally thought, Python was, along with Mel Brooks, Woody Allen, some of the, you know, some of those 70s, because was, that was my formative yeah, sure. year, 70s visionaries that were breaking rules and stuff. But they at least provided inspiration for what is possible. And that rabbit, for me, is that greyhound to chase. That, I'll, that, you know, so to me, that's how they influenced me. And the funny thing is, <laughs> my personal relationship aside, they probably had the biggest comedic influence on, on, my, on my life. Um, and, you know, as you get older, you realize that we're all different. And, you know, I used to get really depressed that I'm never going to be able to, to do that. I'm never going to achieve that. But then gradually it's like, yeah, you know, you achieve what... You do the best work you can do. Yeah. You work I'm, as hard as you can. I, I'm listening to you say this and it's like, okay, yes, true. But Python never came up with be excellent to each other. <laughs> Which but they is came like, up with other stuff. But but it's but it's equally valid, I think, and, and resonant to to I mean, I'm a I was gonna say a generation of people who grew up watching him. I was already in my twenties when I saw Bill and Ted, but I've never forgotten that. That's you know, uh, heartwarming if, and also genuinely inspirational. And Python teaches you not to trust authority. <laughs> Bill and Ted teaches you to actually try to be a good person. Well, I appreciate that. I, Python's a Please tell me that you guys came up with it. It wasn't something Steve Herrick came up with. No, we were at the coffee shop. I remember that moment exactly when it came up, which was we did not expect that to be a big thing. We actually... So we'd written the script, and initially it was... Rufus was still a 27-year-old sophomore who had a van that inexplicably, meaning we never explained it, drove through time. Mm-hmm. And he was going to take them through time to help them with their history test with their van and this dog named Dog Rufus. And I think Rufus was actually a stoner. Bill and Ted never are stoners, even though people think they are, but they aren't. Right. They never did drugs or anything like that. Um, certainly not by the time we were writing them into a movie. Um, but we had no framework. And then for their trip traveling, and it was just, there was something missing. So I remember going, um, hey, what if it turns out that in the future, their music, it's not just about them separating, but what if in the future, as a joke, their music is what saves the world, and so maybe someone comes from the, maybe Rufus comes from the future, so that was the, we rewrote, right. and we're sitting there, and, go, and sitting there at Ships uh, in Westwood. Well, this might have been Ships in, on La Cienega by that time, the Westwood might have been closed by then, we were at Ships, and uh, we were, saying, well, what do they say when they get to the future? And we just said, um, be excellent to each other. I don't remember which of us said it. And party on, dudes. And then we just kept writing. Like, we didn't stop to think, that's it, that's great. We just yeah. like, of course, that's what they would say. And to me, that is a product of just knowing these characters. We weren't trying to say something wise. However, if, if my entire career ends today because of this podcast, <laughs> um, which is very possible, um, and I've created nothing else, and I've added nothing to the culture. Just having been part of a group that put the excellence of each other out there would have made it worthwhile. I think so, too. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Not at all. My thanks to Ed Solomon, whose new film, Bill and Ted Face the Music, will be in theaters and on demand this Friday, August 28th. Please try to see it in the safest possible circumstances. Thanks also to Gwen Hyman and Andrew Carmelini. They know what they did. You can find Ed on Twitter at Ed underscore Solomon, and you can find Monty Python and the Holy Grail on Blu-ray and DVD from Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. It's also available on Apple TV and Google Play, and streaming on Netflix in both the U.S. and Canada. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com, where I'm hosting a bunch of podcasts these days in addition to writing about movies and television. You can find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it, or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you've been enjoying us. Every little bit helps, it truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network. They're good too. Stay inside, watch movies, wear a mask if you go out. And seriously, be excellent to each other. I'll see you next time.